Okay, today we're going to discuss a man named Mohandas Gandhi, uh, who was born in India and um, actually helped the Indian people to win independence from the British Raj, or the British direct rule over India. Um, and Gandhi's ideas of how to do this uh, serve as a really good example of how resistance to imperialism can actually work. Um, so first of all, it's important to review why the British were in India. Um, first of all, uh, nationalism is a strong reason uh, the British government wanted to have, and the British people wanted to have the strongest empire on earth. Um, and India was known as the jewel of the empire, and for a lot of reasons was the most important colony that the British had. Um, probably the most uh, practical reasons, though, for imperialism were... Um, for new markets, basically new supplies for British industrialization as well as British luxury products um, and also new demand. So India served as a, a market for British goods. Um, and then lastly, um, as kind of a smaller reason, uh, the, the British believed in the civilizing mission, um, or some British did. Uh, in some ways this was just an excuse for imperialism, but I think it's important to recognize that for some people um, this was uh, kind of, uh, they saw the British role in India as almost like an unselfish way of, of promoting um, industrial and Victorian values. Um, now, these four reasons, um, not everyone agreed with all of them, but all four of these reasons were uh, pretty much the essential reasons for imperialism in India. Um, just as a review, the British Raj, after the Sepoy Mutiny, um, had direct control over India. Um, this would last from about 1857 all the way until 1948, um, in which India would finally win its independence as several different independent nations. Um, as part of uh, this direct rule, though, the British believed that India could rule itself, but only when it was civilized enough. And so until then, the, the British government passed all laws in Britain, um, they built this modern infrastructure in India, which included railroads, but also educational institutions and universities. Um, the British also promoted Protestant Christianity, um, whether explicitly um, by having missionaries in India or implicitly um, by, for instance, uh, injecting uh, Protestant Christian ideas into some of their statements. Um, and the British also promoted free trade, which was really the most important uh, part of the British Raj was that uh, British businesses and really global businesses um, were able to participate in the Indian economy really without the, the say of the Indian people. Um, so uh, the British government itself basically um, was set up with a, a viceroy who directly ruled India um, in uh, Calcutta and then after 1912 actually in Delhi. Um, these are Indian cities. Uh, so in some ways he's like the the president of India, but he's British, and the Indians don't get to vote on any kind of national policy. Period. So this is not a democracy. This is actually a British imperial rule over, um, you know, hundreds of millions of Indian people. Um, Indians could become part of something known as the civil service. Uh, which is kind of like the government bureaucracy or the government management system. It'd be like working for um, the U.S. government, but they are not able to vote on anything. Um, moreover, Indian industry under the British Raj uh, really suffered because the British uh, promoted this idea of free trade in which um, any business could operate in India regardless of where they were from, and any business could um, you know, import and export out of India with very, very low taxes. Um, this essentially meant that um, countries that uh, had industrialized earlier had an advantage because they had more financial backing, they had more um, industrial resources, and they had more experience. And these companies um, really were at the same starting point as Indian companies, and so they had an advantage within the Indian economy. Um, Indian businesses basically couldn't catch up and they couldn't compete with the British or uh, German or American companies that operated in India. Um, this meant that for the most part, for the average Indian, uh, the economy remained stagnant. Um, although they could get a job in the civil service or get a job with a British company, 
um, Indian companies were not really able to develop. And so the Indian economy was, was pretty much stagnant, while the British economy benefited greatly from this. Uh, there were exceptions to this. Um, probably the, the most prominent was a man named Jamsetji Tata. Um, and this guy actually um, was an Indian industrialist, but the way he was able to get a start was by importing cotton from Egypt. Now, the reason this is significant is India was a huge producer of cotton, um, and Jamsetji Tata was a, um, he was an Indian man, but he wasn't able to source his cotton from India because the trade had basically been dominated by the British. Um, so there's something kind of um, odd about the fact that he had to go to Egypt to get his cloth um, for his industrial factories. Um, the man eventually uh, diversified with the money he had made from making clothing. Uh, he was able to found a, a steel company, a power company. Um, he was able to basically develop the first Indian Institute of Science. So he was this um, really, really proud um, Indian man who wanted to create an Indian vibrant economy. Um, Today, uh, you know, most cars that are driven in India are actually Tata cars, um, and that's uh, the company that this guy started. Um, so the reason I bring this up is because there were exceptions to the rule that the Indian industry was completely dominated by British companies. But if you were an Indian company, it was very difficult to actually create a company that sourced your products or got your raw materials from India. You often had to look elsewhere because British companies had, had kind of monopolized um, Indian industry. Now, um, one other thing before we get to Gandhi was uh, the British education system in India. Um, even critics of uh, the uh, British um, Raj in India point to the fact that the education system that was brought to India did in fact help in some ways the Indian independence movement. Um, because uh, the British uh, had these universities, Indians were able to study there, learn many of the, the policies and kind of the philosophies and the, um, the uh, scientific concepts behind uh, the British industrial economy. And um, as a result, you had, you know, for instance, 60,000 Indians had graduated by 1980. Um, and some of these people who graduated would become, you know, the strongest uh, Indian fighters for independence. Um, and uh, they basically were using the British education system um, as a way to kind of become familiar with the British policies, learn the British policies, and then um, kind of work to dismantle those British policies. Um, now, in order to actually resist the British, um, the Indians had established something known as the Indian National Congress. Um, at first, this was really just uh, a, a group of people that formed without the consent of the British um, who decided that they wanted a greater share in ruling India. They didn't actually want independence. They just wanted a, a, a greater share in, in governing. Um, but after about 20 years of, of petitioning the, the British government, uh, this Indian National Congress hadn't gotten anywhere. So in 1905, they actually decided to change their tactics and focus on complete independence because they believed that they really would never get a share in governing India. Um, you know, the British wouldn't just give that up. And so um, in 1915, uh, 10 years after they decided to push for independence, a man named Mohandas Gandhi actually became president of this Indian National Congress. Um, so Gandhi was actually... Uh, he was a Hindu man born in India and born into a merchant caste. So that was a fairly high caste within the Indian society. Um, so he had some uh, pretty good economic and educational opportunities. He studied law in Britain, so he became a lawyer. Um, he first began practicing his law in South Africa. South Africa was also under British control and uh, was really under this m even more repressive government system than India was. Um, and... Uh, Gandhi led many of the independence movements, or at least the nonviolent resistance movements, um, to end the kind of the rampant racism and discrimination that was taking place in South Africa. So in a lot of ways, he um, got his first experience fighting the British in another colony in South Africa. Um, and then he later returned to India to advocate for independence. Um, and 
what he really was struggling with was the fact that um, the Indians couldn't just fight the British. That wouldn't work. They would tried that. The British had um, more dominant technology. And not only that, it would probably, you know, result in this long, drawn-out, bloody conflict. Um, not only that, in 1915, the, the Indian industry really relied on the British. Um, so even if the Indians did win independence, if they didn't already develop an economy, um, then they would kind of be left um, really vulnerable. They wouldn't have any way to make money. Um, and so the Indians basically needed a way to have independence while still maintaining a strong economy. And so Gandhi actually came up with four um, real particular methods of achieving independence. And we're going to go through all four of them. The first was Swaraj, or self-rule. The second one was Swadeshi, or self-sufficiency. The third one was Satyagraha, or truth force, and the fourth one was really Indian nationalism. So let's look at the first, Swaraj. Um, so what Gandhi advocated for was instead of the Indian villages actually waiting for the British to make decisions, they would make decisions at a local level. So um, in other words, this involved everything from um, you know criminal law to um, determining policies uh, based on the agriculture in the area. Um, and uh, to you know, make voting decisions at a local level, not wait for the British. Um, and so this involved basically most Indian villages um, developing their own uh, local government systems. And they had not done this uh, because mostly throughout Indian um, history, there really wasn't necessarily a democracy. Um, either these uh, areas were under the imperial control of a foreign nation, or before that, they had been under the control of local, um, basically, kings. Um, and so this was kind of a like a practice in democracy. Um, and so Gandhi advocated for uh, these villages to take back their politics. Um, the second one was self-sufficiency, which was maybe the most important one. This was a boycott on all British goods. So the whole reason that the British were in India was... Um, not only to get Indian products, but also to um, uh, sell British products to the Indians. And so if Indians refused to actually work for the British and refused to buy products made by non-Indian businesses, this would kind of cut off the, the profit motive for even being in India. Um, so, for instance, Gandhi advocated for making his own clothes, growing your own food. Here you have a picture of him actually using um, a spinning wheel, which he was very famous for doing. Um, so the Indians actually began to uh, try and s survive without any sort of British product. Um, you also had something known as Satyagraha, or Truth Force. And basically this was non-violent protest and non-violent um, cooperation with the British. Um, so, for instance, um, Martin Luther King Jr. would use this policy during the Civil Rights Movement. Um, and in many ways, it was inspired by what Gandhi had done in India. Um, some of the basic principles of this is to, um, you know, harbor no anger against the British, but to stand in the way of the British, and in some ways, take the blunt of the British anger towards you. Um, so in some ways, it's kind of absorb the British anger. And the idea is that you don't retaliate, you don't actually um, assault or punish the British. You basically submit to the British imperial force, um, and the idea was that by submitting and not resisting, the British won't continue to do this because they'll realize the cruelty of their own acts. Um, in some ways, this seems, you know, it doesn't seem like it would work at first, but it does. If you just stand in the way of a British soldier without resisting, but refusing to do what they ask, chances are the British soldier will react violently. Um, and if you're still not reacting to what the British soldier does, then the British soldier might at some point realize that what they're doing is, is pretty much gratuitous and kind of unnecessary. Um, and the British, as they're trying to um, enact these policies, uh, are basically the ones who are becoming uncivilized and trying to repress the Indian people. The Indian people are just kind of standing there not resisting. And so in many ways, the reason it's called truth force is because it kind of unleashes the truth of the British actions, which is that they're cruel and they are, um, you know, hurting the Indians. And um, the last one is really Indian nationalism. So Gandhi really promoted 
um, Indian culture, Indian music, Indian literature, Indian tradition. Um, and uh, this was a difficult task because Indians were such a diverse people. Um, they're, you know, maybe the biggest difference between Indians was the difference between religion, um, Hinduism and Muslims. But the Indians were able to really unite against um, the British imperialism. And so all Indians had one thing in common, which was that they were ruled by a foreign power and they didn't want to be ruled by a foreign power. Um, so Gandhi really encouraged all these various Indian cultural traditions um, while still trying to unite the Indian people in their fight against the British. Um, some sayings of Gandhi that um, I think give a good idea of what he's trying to do are, this, uh, are, are these. We who seek justice will have to do justice to others. There are many causes that I am prepared to die for, but no causes that I am prepared to kill for. The straight path is as difficult as it is simple. Were it not so, all would follow the straight path. And our ability to reach unity in diversity will be the beauty and test of our civilization. Um, in many ways, these are very, very similar ideas to what Martin Luther King Jr. preached in uh, the 19, late 1950s and 1960s in the United States during the Civil Rights Movement. So um, this works, basically. Um, there are some things that help the Indian independence movement. Um, after World War II, actually not World War I, between 1939 and 1945, the British were financially and physically exhausted and unable to manage global empire. Um, so we will discuss World War I and World War II another time, but by about the 1940s, the British were pretty exhausted and unable to manage this giant empire. Here you can see every country in red was under control of the British government at some point. Um, so the Indian people, after having fought for the British for two world wars, um, began to increase their demands for independence. And really two years later, uh, the Indians were able to achieve this independence. Um, they, they did this by refusing to do things the British way, but refusing in a civilized, non-violent, non-cooperative way. Um, they also did this by embracing their own Indian traditions, whether they're both just Indian economy or um, Indian culture. And um, this would result in a few separate states, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, and Nepal, um, were all independent states created uh, by the British giving independence to India. Um, and Gandhi would actually be assassinated a year later um, by a Hindu extremist who pretty much believed that the Hindus uh, were not as favored as the Muslims during this independence, which he blamed Gandhi for because Gandhi advocated for un unity between Hindus and Muslims. Um, so there's kind of a, a sad after afternote about this, which is that Gandhi's policies and what he advocated for um, eventually, you know, didn't it didn't sit well with all Indian people. Nevertheless, his way of preaching unity actually was what gave the Indian people the strength in many ways to resist the British and to actually achieve their independence. So just as a review, it's basically, um, you know, the way to resist imperialism in this way is to, um, first of all, unite amongst yourselves to make decisions for yourselves and to, uh, have an economy for yourself. So you're not actually participating in the British economy. These things were a lot harder than they seemed, but um, by doing them, the Indian people were able to basically resist and achieve their independence.